Um, I'm delighted to host this panel with a distinguished set of uh, guests. Um, I will start off by framing uh, <coughs> the content of this panel, the context for this panel. So uh, we live in a world we all know. We have conferences like this uh, that have massive amounts of attendance, uh, testifying to sort of the breadth and scope of AI's impact in the world today. Um, AI is everywhere. AI is increasingly in everything. And therefore, it's uh, super important for all of us to start talking about how do we make sure that AI works for everyone because it impacts everyone. Um, this uh, <clears throat> addressing that desire to make sure that AI works for everyone requires uh, a joint effort between nonprofits, governance groups, academia, and industry. Uh, each of these are stakeholders in this process of ensuring that AI works for everyone. Uh, and that's why we have a variety of perspectives uh, on this panel. And uh, with that, my name is Prem Natarajan. I'm uh, vice president in the Alexa unit, uh, Alexa organization uh, at Amazon. Um, <clears throat> and I will ask my fellow panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Tara. Great. Um, thank you so much for having us here. I, my name is Tara Lyons. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit organization called the Partnership on AI. And we're based in San Francisco in the Bay Area. Um, and our focus is we're a multi-stakeholder organization. So we're a coalition of over 95 different entities spanning industry, civil society, and academia. And we are working to generate uh, best practices for AI deployment and development. Um, so our focus is on ethical AI technology, essentially. Um, and we're doing that with a variety of different mechanisms. We do a lot of work convening our partner organizations who often disagree with one another. Um, and we spend a lot of time doing research as a community. So um, my background's in government, actually. I spent about three years in the Obama administration before taking on this role, um, working in the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House on AI policy issues. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm Daniel Castro. I'm the director of a think tank called the Center for Data Innovation. Um, think tanks are, um, most people have heard of them, most people don't know what they actually do. Uh, think tanks are, if you think about academia on one side, kind of pure, pure research, and then you have lobbyists on the far other side doing pure uh, government influence. Think tanks are sitting somewhere in the middle. We're trying to create ideas and influence the policy debate, um, but we're not lobbyists. We're not doing that kind of direct advocacy, and we're not doing pure research for research purpose. We're thinking about how, does, how do ideas influence the public space. So I'm working in the technology policy space and thinking a lot about um, the emerging technologies that we see and how government can play a role in uh, encouraging inclusive innovation. And you know, so the technology does benefit everyone, so we're thinking about the potential consequences of the technology, and we're building um, what I like to think of as guardrails, but not speed bumps or roadblocks in the way of innovation. Hi, I'm Aaron Roth. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania and the co-director of the Network and Social Science Engineering Program. And my background is in, in theoretical computer science and algorithms and machine learning. So with respect to this panel, you know, I spend a lot of my time thinking about definitions. What is it that we mean when we say that we want an algorithm to be fair, when we want an algorithm to be private? How can we be precise about, enough about that to embed that as a constraint that an algorithm can, can understand? And what are the implications of doing so? What are, what are sort of the necessary trade-offs that we have to grapple with when we constrain an algorithm to be fair in a particular way, to be private in a particular way, uh, and you know, both with accuracy and with other kinds of things we might mean by fairness. And hello, I'm Nicole Turner-Lee. I am a fellow at the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. Um, <coughs> I have two things I want to first say that I'm happy that I got on this chair today, <laughs> um, this early this morning at this high. <laughs> so I had to say something with regards to the comfort of these chairs. Um, but that's not related to the topic today. Um, and the work that I focus on is regulatory and legislative policy as it relates to telecommunications and tech, uh, tech policy in general. Um, I work on issues related to digital divide and digital inclusion in terms of ensuring access for all. I have a book coming out next year on the digital divide and how it's creating the new underclass. Um, in the area of artificial intelligence, I have a particular focus in algorithmic bias. 
Um, I'm very interested, as all of our colleagues will speak to, the ethical framing of algorithms, but also how they're ubiquitously deployed to all communities and all people. Um, and so I focus a lot of work on fairness from the sense of the technical fairness that goes into the design, but as well as the um, social science context in which these algorithms are deployed to ensure that they don't amplify uh, stereotypes. Thank you for those introductions. And uh, one last <laughs> comment about the chairs is that We've, we've, we've put fairness on a high perch today, <laughs> so uh, <coughs> so it's uh, so you know that that's really the motivation behind this. So um, so uh, I'll start off the discussion with um, really a question. Uh, it's a meta question about uh, fairness, uh, which is uh, when we talk about fairness, we often talk about how to make uh, an AI algorithm fair. Uh, for a specific task or for a specific application. Um, but the complementary question in my mind is, when is the use of AI fair? When is the UI, uh, use of AI justified uh, or appropriate? And let me exemplify this with uh, something that I learned by reading your uh, uh, work in this topic, Nicole, which is <coughs> uh, that there are lots of companies that are uh, working on tools that predict the probability of people coming in for uh, the, when they have a summons uh, being present in court. And so based on the probability predicted by these uh, algorithms, and these are actually in use now, uh, or at least being considered for deployment, uh, people might be placed into pretrial detention or not to ensure that they show up. But at the same time, social science research on the topic shows that <clears throat> the top reason why people don't show up uh, in court for a summons uh, or for, for their day is either child, lack of child support or lack of transportation. So to me, it brings up this fundamental question, should cities, in light of that research, be investing in algorithms that predict uh, the probability of somebody coming to court? Or is that money better spent providing services in a low-tech solution, providing child support or transportation that actually allows people to come uh, present themselves in court? I mean, I could take that question. I think that's like the critical question mark that we're all dealing with now, right? We know on the one side that um, artificial intelligence systems has really been in line with the growth and development of technology. It's creating more efficiencies, allowing us to streamline data uh, that is massively available in ways that it wasn't maybe 10 years ago. Um, as a result of that, you know, before we actually end up seeming very pessimistic, there are really great applications. I mean, we're seeing a lot in voice recognition. Um, we're seeing a lot of great applications when it comes to healthcare, you know, and social service provision. There are cities that are using this to streamline helplines so that they can actually take in more calls. But the question that you're asking is really the critical question. At what point does the automation in and of itself sort of uh, uh, have us reevaluate the way in which we deliver services mm -hmm. and the consequence for certain populations? So in the case of pretrial sentencing, which is one of the most problematic areas we're seeing algorithmic uh, algorithms sort of deployed, are we taking into consideration not just the fact that people need more transportation services and perhaps social services, but the fact that African Americans are disproportionately incarcerated or disproportionately arrested? So the people that are making up the data fueling that algorithm automatically are overrepresented when it comes to people of color. That is really a critical question. So we're making that prediction. Do we have enough to be fair if we're basing the prediction on you know, a societal truism that has basically uh, guided the criminal justice system? Um, same thing could be said about credit worthiness, right? Mm -hmm. Again, there are particular use cases where I think it's important for us as a society, for companies and civil society organizations, just really, and government in particular, to assess, is this an area that we want to automate? Because we're already behind the ace ball when it comes to actually creating equality in this space. And if we automate it, are we properly you know, taking into consideration the entire ecology in which we're placing the model? And that's a lot, I think, where many of us on the policymaking side, we're conflicted. Because again, we're trying to balance this technological growth of efficiency, the cognitive ability of computer processing to do things that we as humans have not been able to do alongside the society in which we live, mm -hmm. which is the basis for the development of these systems. Uh, yeah. I'll just, um, before you take it, I'll add a slight twist to it because of your computational background. Sometimes it seems to me, in addition to responding to this, 
that uh, AI can actually be used to shed light on certain disparities. So things that remain beyond human ability to understand because uh, latent biases are hidden in massive amounts of data that takes a fair amount of reasoning over to tease out. So uh, maybe you keep that perspective in mind as you add to uh, Nicole's uh, comments. Yeah, thanks. So those were both great points, and I, I agree with both of them, but let me try to elaborate a little bit. So I, I think in this case, and often when we talk about unfairness in machine learning, the aspects of unfairness that we talk about are really um, speaking to the decisions that are made and would be things that we, we would view as unfair no matter who was making the decisions, whether it was an algorithm or a human being. And when we have quantitative sort of, you know, technical algorithms making, the, making decisions, it's not sort of introducing qualitatively new kinds of unfairness necessarily, but it is making very salient the, you know, these disparities because we, we have to measure them to deploy these algorithms. So in the particular use case you're talking about, you know, this is a bad use of prediction, right? You're, you're, you might be predicting something very well, but the thing that's unfair is when you sort of turn around and um, act on those predictions in, in sort of foolish ways because maybe what you were really predicting was, you know, um, lack of access to childcare, but then you, you know, incarcerate someone because you, you think that what you were predicting was an attempt to escape justice. But that doesn't mean you can't use predictive technologies um, sort of more thoughtfully. For example, you could, in this use case, use prediction of, um, you know, if you could predict lack of access to childcare as, a, as an obstruction to, to showing up at trial, you could use that to target resources, for example. So I think that, you know, um, algorithmic decision-making tools are uh, powerful and easy to deploy in incorrect ways, and so we have to be very cautious when we do so. But the fact that you can use them to you know, uh, do unjust things shouldn't be an indictment of algorithms necessarily, just a, just a um, you know, note that we should be thoughtful in their, in their deployment. Agreed. Um, <clears throat> so your point is, it's not fair to blame algorithms for their unfair use. <laughs> uh, but, I don't uh, know about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. We can I get it. <laughs> I do have a follow-up question on yes. that for you. But do either of you want to comment on this, Dan, Tara? Yeah, well, I, I think that gets to, you know, <laughs> one of the things that I really focus on is, um, you know, it, to me, it's so important to keep the focus on outcomes. Um, and when we talk, whether we're talking about operationally or, or uh, in terms of fairness, that it's not just a question of whether an algorithm is fairness. It's, you know, we're looking at the whole, the, the full context of what's happening in some kind of social technical system. Do we see fairness there? And I think when we, we orient our conversation around that, then we can see what role you know, a, a technolo technological tool might play in addressing something, or maybe that we decide it's, it's not appropriate in this case, but it keeps the conversation focused on, on the real outcomes that end up affecting people. And one of the challenges, I think, in this space is because we have, um, I think, this, this new debate growing up about uh, algorithmic fairness and fairness in machine learning, there's a tendency to focus on just that part of the problem, and we end up missing this bigger context, or we end up, end up missing the long-standing ethical debates already in the criminal justice system about how we're doing you know, punishment versus um, rehabilitation, or you know, just there's, there's so much context there that when we focus on you know, the sentencing predictions, that's missing the bigger part of the question about should we even be sentencing people for this particular crime, or you know, the, the larger context there. Um, I think we're also losing sight of the fact that um, when we're talking about government applications, you know, for a long time there has been a focus on how do you eliminate um, bureaucratic discretion. That was a goal for a lot of policymakers to say, you know, we basically, our, our vision of fairness in government is that everyone is treated the same way, that you, know, you, don't have, you don't go to a different government agent and one agent treats one person one way and they treat another person another way. And that's you know, basically what you're trying to achieve when you have algorithms. So there, there is a benefit in, in trying to expand that. I think a lot of times some of the problems we have end up really being problems of accuracy. There are other problems out there too, but I think a lot of the problems are around accuracy. And so it's important that as we think about how do we solve these types of problems that we're seeing if we're thinking about deploying algorithms and, and how they might cause unfairness, 
can we separate the different types of problems we see? You know, some of the needs to be focused on how do we improve accuracy so that if you're not having false positives and false negatives, you're eliminating much of the problem. And then how are we thinking about the context in which we're applying it, and how are we thinking about you know, these bigger issues? So it's not just about fixing the technical system, it's about fixing the overall system. Great, great, uh, great points. I don't have too much to add, but if I was going to wrap this section of the session up in a bow, I think the, um, the easiest way to summarize it is just in saying what you said yourself, Daniel, that these are not just technical systems, they are socio-technical systems. And context in which tools and technology are deployed matter just as much, if not more, than the tools themselves. So I think that's just really important for developers to keep in mind. And, um, and there are structural inequities that really need to be teased out in the context of thinking through this set of challenges. Yeah, I'll, I'll just continue on this thread a bit, um, <clears throat> and uh, this might, you know, uh, following up on a thing about humans are biased too, et cetera. Um, you know, in a recent article I was uh, reading uh, by Nicole here, uh, uh, she and her co-authors defined bias uh, in the context of outcomes which are systematically less favorable to individuals within a particular group and there is no relevant difference between the groups that justifies such harms or such systematic differences. Um, common narrative, as you know, Aaron, is that AI system reflect the biases that are present in the label data. Most AI is still supervised, uh, uh, super trained, supervised, it's annotations introduce the bias. But uh, do AI systems just convey the biases or do they sometimes amplify the biases in data and algorithmically, my question is, can we then come up with s techniques that actually mitigate against these biases in data, even if we don't know what those sources of bias are? Uh, yeah, so they can definitely uh, amplify and introduce their, their own biases, even if you're in this sort of non-existent world in which the data is perfectly clean and free of bias. But maybe it's helpful to give just a simple example. So suppose you're thinking about college admissions and you're, you're looking at SAT scores. Uh, so it would be natu it's natural that the relationship between features and the thing you're trying to predict, some measure of college success, would be different in different populations. For example, a population that takes SAT tutoring classes probably has a different relationship between SAT scores and college success than a population that doesn't. Now a standard thing to do in machine learning is to try to find a model that just minimizes classification error. But if you've got two different populations, say, broken down by race, that are best fit by different models, then if I, if I train a predictive algorithm and I don't allow it to use race, mm -hmm. then it's naturally going to better fit the majority population, not the minority population. Not because there's any sort of racism built into the algorithm, but simply because there are more people in the majority population and minimizing error on the majority population contributes more to minimizing average error than minimizing error on the minority population. So this is a situation in which simply by taking an off-the-shelf machine learning algorithm on clean data, telling it to do something very natural like minimize classification error, will introduce sort of a bias against a minority population simply because um, fitting, fitting the minority population um, doesn't, doesn't optimize its narrowly defined objective as, as much as fitting the majority population. And it, it can't fit both if you have explicitly uh, required that it not use race, for example. Can I respond to that? So I think, um, so one of the nice things about the paper that's being referenced by Prem is that this paper was collaborated on by a social sociologist, a legal scholar, and an engineer. And it took a long time. I mean, just for uh, just to be really transparent about it, this paper took a year because we all disagreed. Um, it was probably one of the most toughest paper, the most tough paper I've ever written because there was a social science perspective, an engineering perspective, and then a legal scholar coming in uh, that had to coalesce all of those views for one work product. Um, but I want to respond, I guess, from the social science context of what Aaron is talking about and respond to this question of whether or not bias exists or are algorithms responding to the bias. There are a couple things actually going on when we actually look at bias in machine learning applications or artificial intelligence. I'd like to define the first one is, we have to be clear that when we are developing these systems that we also need workforces that are very diverse in terms of the populations in which we're trying to serve. 
So if we have in the pipeline of developers the lack of representation of women, of people of color, of people of various ages, we'll find ourselves sort of replicating systems or creating benchmarks that are not representative of the model in which we're trying to actually put out there. So for example, it's very, it's impossible for men to develop a pain threshold that incorporates women without women on the design team. So I'd like to consider that, and we talk about in the paper, this concept of diversity in design. As we see more of these um, models deployed into the regular world in which all of us live, we have to ensure that the developers look very much like the population in which we're serving. That's the first thing. Because sometimes those folks may not recognize that you may have to not necessarily retrofit the algorithm to fit the minority population, but you're just excluding the minority population altogether <laughs> because no one has a seat at the table to tell you that. That's the first thing. I think the second thing that we have to think about is what is the implicit assumptions that people have when they are designing those tools? So what are they thinking about when they think about you know, people who have SAT prep over people who do not? Uh, what factors or measurements or labels are being assigned? What data is being used? One of the challenges in technology that we've come to learn is that there is no census box when it comes to technology that says, I'm African American, I'm a woman, you know, I'm this. Much of the data that we actually receive right now is inferential. It comes up with a composite profile of who we are, and as a result, it assigns us different you know, marketing strategies, et cetera. So I like to use a quick example. I'm an African-American woman who might go on, buy some red shoes. I may buy red shoes, and then later I may buy a Barbie doll for my daughter. Now the computer has picked up that I'm a woman who's a parent or somebody who's a caretaker of a child. I may pick a particular color of that Barbie doll or a particular hair color of that Barbie doll. The computer now makes other assumptions about who I am. Down the line, when the computer somehow figures out with all this inferential data that I might actually be an African-American woman who's a single parent <laughs> with children, I may begin to get offered high predatory, a high interest predatory loan products. And what happens with the algorithm, which is, I think is interesting, I may click on that product because I think it's a pretty fair offering, and then I will receive back more of those offerings. So to your point, you know, we're seeing this environment where we have to understand that it's, the, it's like, I, I like to consider machine learning algorithms as the ocean. The deeper that you go into the ocean, the less transparent and likely you're to know what's actually behind what's driving that, um, what's driving not only the outcomes, but the predictions about your behavior. And that's where I think, going back to your original question, what Aaron's responding to, technologists can look at it from, are there different variables who are receiving disparate treatment? In some cases, yes, the algorithm is wrong. What I'm particularly interested in as a sociologist is their disparate impact as a result of yeah. me receiving high interest predatory loan products. Am I actually still staying within the zone of being uh, service, you know, being part of the wealth gap? or receiving products that per persist my inequalities <laughs> versus allowing me to use the computer to get entry into other areas because of the micro-targeting. I think that's really, and I think Dan can attest to this and, and Tara, this is where policymakers are really finding ourselves in that debate. How do you actually make fairness happen in a way that you recognize that there's a disparate impact on populations, particularly pop protected groups, that maintain and persist inequality in ways that they're not even clear that they're being discriminated against. So I have a follow-up question on that she pointed to you, Dan, which is, um, you know, <laughs> each time we talk about this, uh, I start thinking about the other side yeah. of the equation, which is uh, those loans that were being offered that were predatory, uh, they were still loans. Uh, and the person may need, some, some subset of them need the money. Uh, it may be that without AI and without this targeting, even those loans which are predatory and not defensible and not advocating for them may not have been available to this. So there is this tension between AI as a force for good and AI with potentially negative consequences that we need to deal with. So from a, and, and we know these are early days for policy in, in AI. Uh, we certainly don't want to regulate out of existence something that's a positive force, potentially positive force before it has an opportunity to show its full uh, uh, spectrum of uh, uh, possibilities. So, what what's your take on, on on that tension and how we how policymakers resolve that? Yeah, you know, it's a it's an important question because I think the 
Yeah, I mean, we know you have, you know, beta versions of technology, and the technology in the early days is never as good as it will be in the future. I mean, the early cars were significantly less safe than the ones today, and we keep, you know, moving in this direction. And, you know, there's kind of two views on how you approach technological innovation. Um, one is the, um, what's called the precautionary principle. And this is the idea that uh, technology and innovation is inherently risky. Um, and that, you know, because of this risk, you need to have government uh, basically approve any new advances in this area. And we see this particularly in uh, Europe has embraced this concept um, very explicitly using the term. Um, and, you know, it, some in particular areas um, like, um, uh, you know, genetic engineering or something, and then some in, um, you know, broader areas like AI. And the problem with that is when you have rapid innovation, you don't have government keeping pace. You know, they're, they're not able to approve the new technology at the pace at which the innovation is occurring. The other approach is, you know, kind of the innovation principle, which is the idea that over time innovations generally are good for the public. And so what's most important is to, um, you know, accelerate this innovation and make sure we're getting access to it and then address specific problems as they come up. So why I think this is really important is because it's very easy to pick any technology and think about ways that it might go wrong. Right? I mean, we, we all do that. We love to hear about something, and we you, know, you immediately have all these great ideas about how this technology will, will go wrong. And th I think the, the harder challenge is to think about how might it go right? right? How might this technology actually have positive impact? How might the problems that we think about get addressed by those who are d in, in the process of developing the technology that, that they will recognize some of these challenges. They'll, they'll see them, they might not get it right the first time, but they're gonna get it right over time. They're gonna push software updates out. They're gonna start thinking about what their blind spots were. They know they're out there, they just don't know what they are yet. And so I, I think it's important that we, we recognize that this tension exists and will always exist. So we have two options. We can either allow the technology to go through a, a very kind of regulatory approach where we're gonna have to get approval each stage, which in some contexts might be appropriate. Um, but it's probably not appropriate everywhere. In other places, we probably want to see more of this rapid innovation. Um, and I think part of this, just to also get back to some of these, uh, these other points around fairness, I think we also have to recognize that sometimes there isn't a definition of fairness that actually works for everyone. And that if we, if we get into this model of government has to approve something, we will never approve it because we don't actually agree on the, the definitions of fairness. And we see this, uh, to give a very concrete example of this, um, think about um, insurance for, for drivers, right? So we know that teenage male drivers have accidents. Statistically, they're more likely to have an accident than a, a female teenage driver. And so there's a fairness question here. Do you charge male teenage drivers more for insurance? Um, or do you say, you know, you have to charge males and females the same? I don't know that there's an answer to that. Um, there's about five states that have passed laws saying you cannot use gender as a, uh, as a factor. That's one standard of fairness. With that standard of fairness, women pay more for uh, in-car insurance and they're subsidizing the males who have more accidents. Maybe that's fair, maybe that's not, I, I don't know, but the point is there's not an answer to that that I think everyone's going to agree on. And so if we have again and again these types of problems where there's not a single answer for what is fair, and we have government having to approve new technology, we're not gonna get anywhere fast. And I think that's the real problem in, in this debate. Can, uh, can I just add to that? I think I'm gonna agree and disagree with some of what you've said, Dan. I, I think it's a fairly oversimplistic way to think about technology regulation, to think about the government as either approving or disproving technology. And so one layer I wanna add is just that there is, I think, still the need, especially in AI, to think really deeply. I mean, this vectors back to the conversation we started with this morning on, on contextual capacity and understanding the ways in which structural inequality and inequity really apply to the lens of the, t the tools that are being deployed currently and will be in the future. And um, it still remains the case that we need to think about you know, due process, for example, as a means of creating space for justice in the way that technology is promoted and the outcomes that it produces. Um, and that regulation itself can actually be promoting of innovation in some cases. I mean, we've seen this um, in particular in certain industries like the airline industry, for example, in aviation regulation. It is uh, the safety culture that that has promoted that has really enabled the success, I think, of the innovations that we've seen in that sector in particular. And I think that could be applied to some use cases in the artificial intelligence world as well. So I think that it's, um, it is a, it's not necessarily a, a sort of, 
uh, uh, yes or no um, yeah. to the, the question, should the government step in and regulate? I think it, it really depends on the domain, especially here in the US context where regulation is really applied by application um, of the technology. And I think it also depends on um, the sort of jurisdictional context in which you are. You mentioned Europe, and there's definitely differences between what's happening here and, and what would happen there, for example, as well. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated issue, I guess, is really what I'm trying to convey. Sure. Uh, I just uh, want to move on to sort of a slightly different question. Uh, this topic is, so I knew in starting this question, I was probably setting up an hour-long panel discussion on just that question, uh, but I still wanted to put it in there because I think it's an important one for people to have in their consciousness. Uh, but Tara, I have a question for you, which is that, you know, you're the partnership of AI, you see a lot of companies working in AI, you're doing studies on that, uh, what kind of best practices, et cetera. But, um, you know, despite the fact that AI has achieved superhuman performance on some tasks, especially tasks that require processing massive amounts of data uh, in some kind of limited time, and making inferences on it, in the vernacular and the popular perception, um, a central aspiration for AI is still to achieve human levels of cognition, right? Um, now, same token, we know humans are unfair, they're biased. In fact, you know, as uh, Aaron was alluding to, some of the biases in systems come from the fact that humans are biased. In that context, I've been wondering, is our f aspiration for fairness in AI systems achieving human levels of fairness, or do we have a higher aspiration for AI? And, and then I'll get into, is it a fair aspiration for AI to be more fair than humans? But okay. uh, well, this, in some ways, is a deeply philosophical question. So I'm curious to hear the responses of my fellow panelists as well. But I think um, one way to start a response is um, in, I think, a comment that Aaron was making earlier, where uh, one interesting aspect of AI is that it can actually help us, and I think you said this yourself actually, Prem, it can help us shed light on the limitations of the current human world in which we exist and the biases that we currently um, apply to specific questions. So I think that's one thing for us to keep in mind about the promise of, um, of this technology, but it needs to, the ways in which we deploy it again need to be, we need to be hyper cautious about, right? So um, it is not necessarily true that in all circumstances, technology should be answering questions on behalf of people. Um, it might be true that in some contexts, it can help us answer them better, um, or uh, in supplement to human decision making, or it should be replacing human decision making in some context. So it really, it really depends. Um, I also will just say that I, I think you know, we, we talk a lot at the partnership about how humans are the, uh, the thing that's wrong about AI. <laughs> um, humans are creating AI, and, uh, and this again turns back to something that you were talking about, Nicole, which is what the composition of the populations that are working on developing AI and working to deploy it look like themselves. And I think that um, something we do a lot of work on as a community of uh, stakeholders with interests across a really diverse spectrum um, an array is uh, what we call contextual capacity building. So this mm. is something that um, that uh, we feel really strongly about as a community because um, because uh, the idea that developers are disconnected and sort of working in their cubicle world um, to ship products that and services that have impact on real human beings without really being in contact with those systems and structures as we've talked about today. Um, is, is really an old way, I think, of thinking yeah. about product development. And what we are seeing ushered in by this new era of technology development is more awareness of these challenges and limitations of technology, and hopefully more capacity built to actually connect those communities that are being impacted by its deployment to those who are actually developing it. Great. Uh, Dan, Alan. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that feedback loop is, is incredibly important. That's something that we talk a lot about and, and I, I think can be part of regulatory policy and, and hasn't been in the past. I mean, when we think about, um, you know, the, the kind of the problems we see in the market with, you know, people say a company is doing something that causes something, um, some kind of negative outcome. Um, you know, that's an externality in economics terms, right? And we see these negative externalities, and it's an externality in the sense that the company isn't, isn't internalizing, right? It's not thinking about it, it doesn't have to think about it. And 
for a long time, um, and, and even today, this is a core part of a lot of um, technology. We, we, it's, it's created, it's put out there. Um, there are terms of service that say, if something goes wrong, it's kind of on you. Um, and in some ways, that's good. I mean, that liability protection has allowed companies to, I think, innovate, and it's offloaded that responsibility of deciding where something can be applied to the one who's actually deploying it. Um, but it's, I think there, there still might be some gaps there in terms of how do we get a better feedback loop? And so when we're thinking about what the next stage of um, you know, policy in this space might be, we think a lot about what we call algorithmic accountability. So this is the concept that um, operators, so not the developer of the technology, but the operator of the technology, needs to understand um, the, um, whether the system is performing as intended. And it needs to understand and be aware of um, harms that are happening and then mitigating those harms. And so the idea is, is you know, fundamentally kind of simple, but it actually doesn't exist today, right? So the concept is if you're deploying something, you, you really need to have processes in place to figure out, you know, are you getting feedback? When things are going wrong, are you capturing that? Um, and then when you are capturing that, what are you doing to fix those problems? So the idea that if a company has a system that they're operating that is causing harm to, to individuals or groups of individuals, and uh, that was by design, well, that's definitely a problem. And if it's not by design, but um, they're, they're ignoring it, they're being willfully ignorant, that's a problem. If they're not being willfully ignorant, but they're just not doing anything about it, then that's also a problem. And that you know, we, can, we can kind of stack the regulatory response then to when you know, regulars come in and they say, this group is being harmed, we're gonna take action against the company. And the degree of action, the degree of a penalty is gonna be proportional to whether or not they are trying to fix these problems. So a company, might still cause harm, but if they're doing everything they can to prevent it, then you know, they're, they're in the good actor bucket. If you're a company that's being willfully ignorant or doing something else, then you're in this other space. And the goal is can we really incentivize the private sector to take these concerns that we're all talking about as, as something that is critical to their line of business? And I think we can, we can get there in a way that isn't necessarily prescriptive. It's not the government saying, you know, you have to do these, these five things in all these areas because, I mean, as Sarah pointed out, it's very contextual. And so for government to do that, I think, is, is very difficult. Um, and there's, of course, a lot more government can do in terms of helping us get to that space. But just on the regulatory part of it, I think there's, there's a lot we can do to kind of reorient that conversation. Thanks. Um, and I'm going to ask you to hold on because <clears throat> I'm going to follow up with a couple of questions sure. related to this after you give your answers. So, Nicole, if you Yeah, can if I can just briefly just sort of um, yeah. respond to that. So I think um, this whole question of is there, can we ever achieve true fairness? You know, I honestly don't think we can just because of some of the challenges that we're talking about in terms of placing uh, a computer model within the context of historical biases, you know, until we sort of get rid of all those biases, we'll still have these embedded. But I think there are things that we can do to actually have um, some type of hygiene when it comes to the deployment of these tools. Um, the first is, from a policy perspective, just clarifying with the development community that they're not exempted from um, the rules and statutes that have defined fairness and social justice in our society. Uh, fair credit, non-discrimination laws, uh, housing. <laughs> you know, if we start there, we've actually started with a framework. There's a great example of a company that uses the EOC when they're creating um, employment algorithms to ensure that they're in compliance with those rules. And as a result, they're able to audit out <laughs> where there might be you know, appearances of bias to make sure they're doing something well. That's a self-regulatory model also because it pushes companies to the top to sort of gain what I'm calling this energy star rating when it comes to your algorithm. We did this in the past, if you remember, when we had appliances. You know, We had all these choices as consumers of what appliance, what brand we could purchase. It wasn't until we saw the label that said this is an energy efficient appliance where we actually gained confidence in that company. I think what we're gonna see as, as artificial intelligence and autonomous systems actually find themselves into these places that become more sensitive, consumers and civil society responding. And to Dan's point, you know, making the marketplace create, I think, models that are much more resilient, much less biased, or have the ability to have feedback to make those types of corrections. And I would just say on the last part in terms of government's role, I think it's important, as Dan said, for government not to overregulate, but I also think it's important for government, just like we did with the fintech space, to have places and areas where we can do anti-bias experimentation. So if you can't use race, 
it's very hard, for example, to apply other proxies and at the end of the day not, you know, not be clear if you're gonna actually have an intended or unintended consequence. Are there particular use cases where the application of, of safe harbors of companies or some type of um, safe space where you could actually use those, ver those features without necessarily- You mean creating a protected set of experimentations e exactly. that companies can engage in exactly. to understand fairness without being penalized for actually doing that experiment. And before, we saw it yeah. in the fintech space. Yeah. I mean, we saw a lot of that. Where we are with fintech has a lot to do with some of that. So that's one of the things that we push in the paper yeah. in addition to, you know, again, I, I think most citizens are okay with, you know, whatever the machine tells us in terms of the next movie to watch, the next dress to buy, the next product to purchase. You know, we're at Amazon. I love it when I get my recommendations, right? Yeah. It's a plug. <laughs> but, but where it gets hairy, I think, are in these use cases that have a context in which you cannot take them out of the context without you know, possibly inflicting more harm. So, and that opens up a host of computational questions I have for you, so I've got to sort of moderate my own excitement <laughs> in asking those of you. Um, and I'll start with one that we may not address actually, but for example, as we were talking about these, I was thinking, there are all kinds of privileged protected attributes that we might want access to in order yes. to run these experiments. And you've done work in differential privacy, and. Uh, I'm sure there are extensions of it for differential fairness, though the notion of differential and fairness going together is itself a sort of exciting <laughs> <coughs> you know, uh, linguistic construct. <coughs> but um, uh, we'll get to that maybe later. But I wanted to start with this, uh, this book that you're writing uh, that's coming up, the ethical, or that you've written that's going to be available on Amazon and other uh, <laughs> places. Right, so <coughs> Thanks for the plug, the ethical algorithm available for pre-order now. Yeah. So, but, um, you know, that made me think about, is it really the algorithm that needs to be ethical? Um, or is it people, processes, institutions using those algorithms? Um, from my perspective, even though I find a mathematical guarantee of fairness to be super appealing, in part because in the context of this aspiration discussion, it implies an ability to overcome human frailties. Right? Mathematical guarantee of fairness is awesome. But if the algorithm falls short of being able to offer such a guarantee. Uh, are you worried that you might be creating a situation where uh, we've, you've now given a theoretical framework for people to say, hey, Professor Roth said it's not me, it's the algorithm? Yeah, uh, so great question. So, so let me um, start with pointing out that like a common response that we hear when, when we when people hear the title of our book, The Ethical Algorithm, is, uh, you know, why would you impart like a moral character on an algorithm? An algorithm is a, you know, like human artifact, like a hammer, and it would be ridiculous to talk about an ethical hammer, even though you could do unethical things with a hammer, you know, like acts of violence. If you did, it wouldn't be a moral failing of the hammer, it would be a moral failing of the person wielding it. So, so we, our algorithm is different. And Algorithms, of course, are not to themselves like moral agents, but, but they are quite different from hammers in the sense that the human beings who design and deploy them are several degrees of separation away from the decisions that they make. Like, like in some sense, bias in AI would be much easier to deal with if the misdeeds of algorithms could be traced back to evil developers who were, you know, like <laughs> in intentionally embedding racism None into their algorithms. But, yeah. but that's not the case, right? The case, the, the, the reality is sort of much more complicated than that, right? These kinds, of, the, the kinds of incidents of bias we're seeing in algorithms are sort of the unintentional side effects of developers and scientists following reasonable, you know, well-studied methodologies. So because the human beings are several degrees removed from the, uh, you know, actual decision-making of the algorithm, you know, if we want them to, if we want algorithms to obey you know, the kinds of social norms we would expect from human beings if they were in the same parts of the decision-making pipeline that we're putting the algorithms, we have to think carefully about what those are, what do we mean when we say privacy and fairness, right? Like, like not just precisely the way a philosopher would, but, but sort of mathematically precisely if we wanna embed these as constraints into algorithms. And of course, um, what we mean is a very delicate, complicated question. There's many different things we might mean. Some of them are mathematically incompatible with one another and others you know, aren't, but reasonable people could disagree. So 
you know, that part's not easy and, and definitely, you know, if I propose one kind of like technical definition of fairness and, you know, like embed it into an algorithm and you don't like it, I, you know, I can't get off the hook by just blaming the algorithm, right? Ultimately, you know, it's still the, you know, firmly in the domain of human decision making to figure out what it is we want, what we, what we mean by fairness. And, you know, I don't get off the hook just because I, you know, attach the word fairness to some mathematical constraint, right? So human beings are ultimately the ones responsible, but, you know, like purely human oversight just isn't gonna scale to every decision made by an algorithm. And so if we, if we wanna reap the sort of benefits of automated algorithmic decision making, we've gotta embed these norms into the algorithms and, and there's a sort of, you know, whole fascinating science around trying to do that. Can, can I respond? So I think what you're saying, Aaron, is, is true uh, from my learning from the engineer, but I don't think it's okay. Because even though it may be six degrees removed from the human, the algorithm is essentially uh, disproportionately incarcerating more African Americans. It's disproportionately kicking more women out of the system for employment opportunities. It's placing more children who have special needs, who have a desire, or whose teacher would like to give them tailor curricula out of that, that bucket. It's ensuring that uh, low income kids who happen to be a particular color don't get into Harvard. I think that's problematic, right? Because I think at the end of the day, the hammer is still wielded by somebody, right? And math has always been seen as this discrete scientific factor, and I think it has, but now we're seeing it deployed in everyday life that make decisions around the future fate of where people land. And so we have to come up with what we call in, in, at Brookings responsible AI. What does it mean when you actually find yourself in that part of the ocean that is so deep that it has an uh, uh, unintended consequence that furthers inequality for segments of populations that's both context, contextual, but it also has implications in terms of design. I'm a PhD in sociology. When I want to study a human subject, I have to go through IRB. I have to go to a governing body to tell them why I want to study, that I'm not harming anybody, and it could take a year for me to get that approval to do IRB. You know that as a professor. For a young developer who's sitting at a tech company, it's about rush to market. And so it's permissionless forgiveness. Oh man, I made a mistake. And we need to have better processes, much of what you've deployed at Amazon, which allow us to audit, to, well one, to actually have these impact statements. Do we have the right people at the table? Are we assessing the right context? What is the feedback loop for which we may have an unintended consequence? Is this an area where we need to throw in other features to ensure that we're actually testing this in other secondary tertiary samples? Do we need to go back and see if this really worked? Should we abandon this? And I think what we're seeing in the tech space is sort of this idea that everything works. And it does from the math side of it, but it doesn't on the people. So. so I, by the way, like in, entirely agree, and all of all, <laughs> all, all, all of those bad things that you mentioned are the kinds of things that sort of happen when you deploy algorithms without thinking carefully about them. And the kind of science that, that I work on and that I advocate revolves around, you know, like trying to figure out why those things happen, what we can do to prevent them, right? We have to modify the algorithm in some way if we don't want them to do those things. The question is, is how and That's what right. are the costs? And you're, but, and you're few and far between. I mean, what, what we see are few and far between. With the massive amounts of data, we're not seeing that type of deployment. And so what happens, our sociologists and other social <coughs> scientists and other organizations like myself are percolating with trying to figure out the other side of the black box. And I think that's where we are in this conversation. So, um, <clears throat> you know, Super exciting discussion, of course, uh, and, but also uh, I want to be fair because I have a question for Dan, right, which I've not uh, asked yet, which is, and you have a lot of government experience, policy experience, regulation experience, et cetera. You've been involved in how IT has been instrumented for maximum impact, IT advances, uh, information technology advances uh, in, in, in our country and worldwide. If there's one thing you could do to accelerate the momentum of research in AI and in fair AI, uh, it doesn't have to be one thing. It's always nice, it feels nice to pose a question that way. If, if there's one thing you could do, but what is it that you would do if, if, uh, if there was one shaping uh, 
thing. That's a great question. And I was, I, I've been kind of going down a, a rabbit hole in my head. As soon as you mentioned, you know, an ethical hammer, I was, I was just thinking, you know, is, is Thor's hammer ethical? Because it can only be wielded by someone who, uh, you know, is worthy. And anyway, so I'm, I'm glad we're changing the conversation because otherwise I'd be talking about Thor. Um, uh, well, th that's, that's true. And so, you know, but that gets to questions of, you know, who companies sell to, which uh, probably we're not going to go down here. I think the, um, the, the, there's unfortunately no silver bullet for fairness, but we have a huge arsenal um, of things we can do to help address this problem. And I think it's, it's critical that we do. And I really agree, Tara, with your earlier point that it's not just about regulation in black and white. I didn't mean to suggest that. Um, we talk a lot about um, you know, the, the full you know, range of activities the government can do to address both the um, inclusiveness of the innovation and, and to encourage its advancement. And in AI in particular, um, one of our, our main points to policymakers right now is the U.S. needs to be developing a national strategy around AI. And what that means is, um, you know, it, it needs to be thinking uh, very carefully about the implications of AI for um, economic and national security and the wide range of policy levers at its disposal to help ensure U.S. competitiveness in this space. And in particular, I think this matters if we're just talking about the, the future of the technology, and, and we're doing a report that's coming out in a month that's assessing where the U.S. is compared to um, China and Europe. And, you know, we see this, you know, I don't want to call it necessarily a threat, but China will be better at the U.S. at AI across a number of metrics in relatively few years at the current trajectory. And so for all the debates that we're having around this table and other tables, about what the US or what Europe should be doing around ethics and fairness around AI won't really matter if it's you know, China that's leading it. It'll matter what China is doing in this space. And so I, I think there's kind of two implications of that. One, if we want to have kind of the, the main seats at the table, we need to continue our, our dominance just in general in AI and, and continue to be the leaders in the field. Uh, and two, we need to be working with China now so that when they're also kind of leading in this space, um, we have shared values. And I think there's different international forums for doing that. Um, but in terms of what we can do right now in a, a national strategy, some of this is about R&D. It's thinking very carefully about where we're prioritizing NSF dollars um, around different types of questions, whether it's about explainability of AI, getting metrics for fairness so that we can regulate in this space, uh, looking at different application areas and, and kind of um, encouraging the science in that space. It's about um, the workforce side of this. Uh, you know, it is about how do we ensure that we have a diverse workforce so that we do have, you know, um, uh, you know, people at the table who are thinking about it have lived these life experiences that they can address those types of issues. I think it's also about improving the education in this space. Um, as much as I think we need diverse workforces, that to me, given the current pipeline, is going to be a long-term solution. I think a lot of people are saying, well, what can we do now to address this issue? And so I think part of that's education. It's about incorporating these questions of ethics and fairness into the curricula. Um, and there's, there's, you know, I think a lot more. There's, there's also questions around data. One of the earliest papers we did looking at this issue was around what we were calling data poverty or data discrimination, this idea that for many people, the biggest problem about them wasn't privacy. It's not that too much data was being collected about them. It was that too little data was being collected about them. And we see this again and again. I mean, if you look at um, cars and how they, safety was designed for them, for the longest time, there was one crash test dummy. It was designed for the 50 you know, 50th percentile male. And that was great for that range of, of people, but that really left off a lot of women. And it wasn't until we had regulation and policy come in place and say, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. We're gonna have multiple trash test dummies to represent a broader piece of the population. And I think with data, especially, there's this question of can government have a seat at the table in helping really identify where there are gaps and helping encourage completeness and timeliness and accuracy to address these types of problems. So there's a, there's a lot in this space. So I have a follow up on that uh, for you, actually, um, <clears throat> which is we just heard uh, Nicole and Aaron talk about you know, the need for thoughtful use of AI. Uh, and Dan was talking about the need for a national strategy for AI. Uh, but there was also, during the discussion, uh, allusion to the fact that AI is now broadly available most people can use it, et cetera, which to me opens up a question, not just within universities, but given the profusion of AI capabilities available to, for use, uh, what does somebody like the Partnership for AI do to improve the education of both AI researchers and AI developers, right? Uh, given, you know, there's so much available out there that can be used quickly, 
and give impressive results, the appeal is too much to resist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I, so one thing I did not mention in the introduction uh, was that the partnership was founded by a, a coalition of very large tech companies. Amazon was one of them, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple, IBM and a coalition of civil society organizations. So we have the ACLU on our board, actually the MacArthur Foundation um, is in private philanthropy and is one of our um, grantors, uh, the Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, EFF. There's a whole host of, um, of, of really interesting, diverse perspectives in our work. And I think one of the motivations behind inciting this effort was really this question of the extent to which there is a tremendous amount of power that exists in industry right now. And I, what I was gonna say in response to your comments, um, uh, Daniel, was that I completely agree with a lot of what you said. I think government has a huge role to play. But industry's power right now is outsized, actually, compared to a lot of the different levers that we have available to us in terms of influencing outcomes of the sort that we have been discussing all morning on this panel. And, um, and a, a real, I guess the real theory of change of this that this whole effort at the partnership is that developers and product designers and uh, researchers at these huge tech companies have a real role to play in claiming responsibility for and acting on behalf of a lot of the populations that they're impacting and developing and designing the work that they're conducting. So, um, and, and following that, there is an equal amount of necessity to have their perspectives augmented by the diverse uh, viewpoints of uh, uh, all the other organizations that I described and expertise from different disciplines as well. And I think that's been a theme of this pa panel that we've maybe underplayed or not spoken about explicitly, but interdisciplinarity is really, really yeah. critical to positive outcomes here. And I think uh, vectors back to the points we were dis discussing around um, research and development, government strategy, I think where we put our money uh, needs to also include investments in teams that are thinking from multiple angles about these challenges. And you know, this all layers into the contextual context that we have been talking about this so morning too. A good point, so multiple disciplines, multiple equities are involved in this discussion. Uh, we're at the point where we sort of have to wrap up, so I'm going to do the following. There's one question I want to get in, uh -oh. which I'm going to ask Aaron and you to answer for 30 seconds each. Okay. And then, no, so that, Jeopardy. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you can ask the question back and I'll say next, right? So the, uh, uh, and then you, the two of you can offer your uh, closing uh, comments on this. So Aaron, um, you know, those of us who've been in science and engineering for uh, our lives, uh, there's this old adage from, or saying from Lord Kelvin, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, you can't know it. Um, and to me, it seems like we talk about fairness, about the importance of fairness. I'm curious, from your perspective, where is the state of the art? You know, obviously, we don't have a fairness ruler that says we have three centimeters, you know, or five inches of fairness, or six pounds of fairness. But what are our measurement? Wh what do you think is the state of the art in the measurement? And the reason I mentioned you've done this from a social perspective, you're doing it from a computational perspective. So just 30 second responses from you on the state of the art in measurement. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is sort of maybe one of the most interesting ongoing questions in the field is, you know, what are the things we might mean by fairness? And mostly what people do right now are they measure sort of these coarse, naive statistics. They look at like the difference between false positive rates between populations. And it's not hard if you, you know, sit down and think about it to figure out where those can go wrong, where those aren't really getting at what you want. And so um, we don't know quite what we mean by fairness and, and there's sort of, you know, you can propose a, a definition, but like it, it's got to be actionable. You've got to be able to implement it without making assumptions. Um, so, so I would say like right now we have easy to measure but poor measures of fairness. And a big part of my research agenda is, is trying to think about how we can improve on those. So do you think it's like uh, Jeff Bezos was talking about sensors and saying grasping will be solved in the next 10 years. Measuring fairness will be solved in the next three years, five years, <laughs> ten years. Right? So. Uh, measure, you know, solved is too strong a word. But, but um, you know, before I worked on fairness, I worked on differential privacy. There, I think it's sort of 
largely been a success story. And I, the fairness literature now looks like the privacy literature 10 years ago. Great. So, so that's a reason for optimism, that's right. uh, Nicole? Yeah, I would say, and, and, and it's been great because I'm sort of reliving my paper <laughs> experiences the next to Aaron. But I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> the fact that we, uh, we could all be dis interdisciplinary and get along is actually a good thing, right? I think for the social science community, it's the moral compass of where the outcome lands, right? And it's the, it's the assessment of fairness in the context of the um, activities that have led to what is current standards of fairness that I think most people are having issue with. Uh, you know, again, if it takes away or places people at greater harm, have we created a fair and just society or have we allowed computers to sort of amplify those things that we ran away from or that we've tried to improve as a democracy, um, or, you know, as a global society. So I think that that's, to Aaron's point, we can measure it, but you know, kind of going back to what Tara talked about, but we can see it, we can feel it, and because of that discomfort in terms of the context of the deployment of these new technologies, it's just a question I think okay. probably in three years we need a more proactive construct yep. for at least identifying it and being able to come up with mitigation strategies that at least start the process. Rather than measure fairness, measure outcomes. Yeah. Can uh, I just offer a, a quick remark and that's that I think fairness also comes about through participation. And so I encourage everyone in this room right now, there's a request for comment from the National Institute of Standards of Technology. They're thinking about standards specifically around fairness and safety and other things around AI. Um, it's very easy to submit a comment. You can literally just send them an email, um, but it's uh, open for a couple more weeks. I'd encourage everyone in this room who's thinking about this, who can think about how this might apply in your product, just to send a couple of paragraphs and, and get your voice on the record. I think that's the kind of feedback that government often looks for and doesn't always get. And so if you're in this room, you're obviously thinking about it, spend 15 more minutes thinking about it, send an email, I think that'd be hugely valuable. And just a shameless plug, all of the stuff that we talked about is available on our websites for the think tank okay. people. <laughs> so, minus 30 seconds for you. Yeah. So, yeah. I think we've beaten the horse dead. This has been a great discussion. Thank you, okay. everyone. So, thank you all. I will just uh, end by saying that um, uh, Tara is right to exhort uh, companies to do more, uh, all sectors to do more, all uh, equities to do more. Uh, from, our, uh, from Amazon, uh, we've launched this uh, collaboration or partnership with NSF on the NSF uh, Amazon Fairness uh, Research Grant. Um, it's a total of uh, 20 million over three years. Amazon is contributing 10 million to it. Uh, NSF will be funding 10 million. Uh, all universities are uh, welcome to apply. Um, and uh, important point there is the selection process, to be fair, is actually NSF's merit-based selection process. We've left the entire selection, the review of proposals, et cetera, to the standard NSF process. We're only interested in funding and furthering this work so that we can all benefit from it and use those outcomes and the technologies we deploy to ensure maximal, uh, that AI really does work for everyone. So with that, thank you all for your attention. Thank you to the panelists for your <laughs>